I literally am in the process of losing my voice. Not that I had much of one to start with. But today's message is a good one. I say it's a good one because it was laid on my heart by the Holy Spirit. It has to be good. No matter what I do to it, it still has to be a good message. And it's titled, The Wisdom of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. So we're going to look at it as, as a, from a wisdom point of view. Not just a good thing to do, not just a saving thing to do, not just something we ought to do because we don't want to go to hell, but a wise thing to do. In 1 Corinthians 2.9, the Apostle Paul made a statement. It intrigued people for generations, still intriguing. That is what the scriptures uh, mean when they say, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. No mind has imagined. Now, I got a wonderful imagination. I see myself as a handsome young man with a strong speaking voice that can sing on every key. Okay, it's a fantasy life, but still, I can imagine it. I can't imagine what God could have prepared that my mind isn't capable of imagining. But I know that to be true because he tells me that's true. I am looking forward to, the older I get, the more I look forward to it, is finding out for myself so I no longer have to try to imagine. We have a difference between human wisdom and godly wisdom. And that wisdom is in the message of the gospel. Paul quoted Isaiah 64, 4. For since the world began, no eye has heard, no eye has seen a God like you whose works for them who wait for you. So when he told us that we can't imagine, he's repeating what we were told in Isaiah. There's a consistency of wisdom throughout the word of God. Believers in Corneth, they had a rocky time. We could probably relate to them. They were relying on human wisdom. They were trying to problem solve things themselves. We're talking a little bit about that this morning. And we're supposed to give God our problems. God will solve them God's way. But then, not mentioning Sister Ann's name, sometimes we want to suggest to God how to solve that problem. God, I think this would work for you. I about laughed when you said that. I knew we'd be talking about this in church, and it's just it's so timely. And we want to problem solve for God. We can't do that. We can't outthink God. We can't twist what God says. We have to believe what God says, trust what God says, and understand that our human wisdom fails us. We cannot become advisors to God. We can only be worshipers of God, servants. Corinth, they were val uh, valuing worldly intelligence and philosophy. That's kind of a, a world church today a lot of times. They look at the message, how it uh, affects you. There's prosperity preachers, these ones that preach all this stuff that is nowhere in the scriptures. Not too many are preaching hell is still hot, but they're preaching God wants you wealthy and doesn't want you suffering. God doesn't want any of this. I'm not saying God wants it, but God allows it. You will suffer. You will go without things that you want. God says he'll supply our every need, not our every want. When he takes our wants away from us, we sometimes confuse that with needs. Paul also talked about God's wisdom being revealed by the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 2.10 But it was to us that God revealed these things by His Spirit. For His Spirit searches out everything and shows us God's deep secrets. In 1 Corinthians 2.12 and 14 And we have received God's Spirit, not the world's Spirit, so we can know the wonderful things God has freely given us. 
When we tell you these things, we do not use words that come from human wisdom. Instead, we speak words given to us by the Holy Spirit, by the, by the Spirit, using the Spirit's words to explain spiritual truths. But people who aren't spiritual can't receive the truth from God's Spirit. It all sounds foolish to them, and they can't understand it, for only those who are spiritual can understand what the Spirit means. To understand God's truth, you have to understand who God is. You have to have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. You have to receive the Holy Spirit to dwell within you. That's the only way we can even begin to understand the wisdom of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If the world's rulers would submit to God, we wouldn't need a millennial. It would be heaven on earth but they're not going to. They submit to Satan, and that's why it's hell on earth. 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 8. Yet when I was among uh, mature believers, I do speak with words of wisdom, but not the kind of wisdom that belongs to this world or to the rulers of this world, who are soon forgotten. No, the wisdom we speak of is the mystery of God, his plan that was previously hidden, even though he made it for our ultimate glory before uh, the world began, but the rulers of this world have not understood it. If they had, they would not have crucified our glorious Lord. Here Paul's talking about the way of our salvation was secured before the foundation of the earth was laid, before Adam was created. We don't know the timeline between Satan being kicked out of heaven and, and that, but we do know that it was before the foundation of the earth was laid. God made a way for us. When he created us on day six, at the end of the day, he looked and said, everything he created, and it is good. But yet, the it is good was going to eventually cause the death, horrible death, crucifixion, of his son, Jesus Christ. But yet, God said, it is good. So when God looks at you, it is good. You may not be happy with yourself, but don't look at yourself through your wisdom. Look at yourself through God's wisdom. He created you. Years and years and years and years and years ago, Jackie and I went to a thing called Marriage Encounter. And one of the catchphrases there was, God does not make, ju does not make junk. We make junk. We collect junk. Sometimes we feel like junk. God does not make junk. He created a being, and he said, that is good. So we first have to start looking at ourselves the way God does. Jesus' words, Father, forgive them, for they know, what, know not what they were doing, are found in Luke 23, uh, 34. Jesus is looking down from his cross. He's looking at a scene. I, I can't imagine the scene that he's looking on. He's in pain. He's barely functional. Glenda talked about her and I weakening voice and got to replace us. Well, Christ is weakening past the point of all, all human endurance. Hanging on that cross. And the Roman soldiers were gambling over his clothing. Gambling. He's naked on the cross. That's how they crucified you. They made you naked. They also wounded you so you were bleeding. You were hurting. You were suffering. The criminals on either side of him at that time were both piling on him. The one hadn't come to see the light yet. So right up until almost the moment of death, this person was reviling against Christ. But God had created him. God does not create junk. The crowd was blaspheming him. This was the bus most unworthy lot of human beings that's ever gathered together. You and I would have fit right in. We would have been right at home among them. Oh, Brother Bob, how can you say that? I wouldn't say that about my Lord. You deny our Lord many times in your life by many things that you do and don't do. We all do. I call myself a 
repetitive repenter this morning. That's not untrue. I have to constantly seek repentance, forgiveness, how I fail God. Jesus prayed for this lot, and he's praying for us right now, praying for you, praying for me, praying for our church, praying for our nation, praying for our world. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. This prayer is unmatched in mercy out of anything in the world. That has more mercy in that prayer than anything else. It's the mercy of Jesus Christ for those that are tormenting them and killing them. Well, that's godly wisdom. Our human wisdom finds that very hard to comprehend. I'm almost sure if someone wanted to beat me to death, I would probably resist. But Christ submitted. Even in his agony, he wasn't concerned about himself. He was concerned about those that were killing him, his enemies. When he tells us, love your enemy, he practiced love your enemy. He asked God to forgive the thieves on the cross who were jeering him, blaspheming him. He asked God to forgive them. He asked God to forgive the Roman soldiers. They beat him, yanked his beard out, crown of thorns upon his head. I've seen medical descriptions of what the beatings would have done, and it absolutely flayed the flesh off his back. That back was against that rugged cross right now. I can't imagine the amount of agony that he's going through. And yet, in his mercy, he's asking forgiveness, not to have these sins held against them, because they know not what they do. That's godly wisdom. That's in Mark 15, 29 and 30. It's important to notice that Jesus' prayer to forgive them doesn't mean that everyone was forgiven unilaterally. We talked a little bit about that in Sunday school. Unilateral forgiveness. No matter what you do, there is nobody going to hell. There are preachers that will preach that from a pulpit. There are teachers that will teach that from a classroom. There are people that believe that in their heart. And they're all wrong. Without repentance and faith, without a loving relationship with Jesus Christ, without accepting the salvation of his sacrifice, you will not receive forgiveness. Father, forgive them. That shows the merciful heart of God. He wants to forgive you. Think of the foulest human being who's ever lived that you can think of, who's done more horrible things than any other person ever and if they repented and sought God he would forgive them that's not human wisdom that's godly wisdom that's not human mercy that's godly mercy he was fulfilling an Old Testament prophecy when Jesus said this everything he did fulfilled prophecies Everything he did testified to the Old Testament. Everything he did was exactly what he was supposed to do. The prophecy was, he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. So in the Old Testament, it was prophesied that Jesus would bear these sins, go through what he went through, and yet ask for forgiveness for the ones doing it. Everything about Jesus was fulfilling everything God has said. I don't know about you, but I sometimes have a hard time following the examples, the instructions that Jesus gave us. He lived and never failed once. I live and fail often. But Isaiah 32, uh, 53, 12 says, From the cross, Jesus interceded for sinners. 
Today, risen and glorified, Jesus remains the one mediator between God and mankind. Jesus is still the only way to seek forgiveness. He's the one mediator, the one and only way. Without Jesus Christ, you are lost. No matter how bad God wants you to be saved, no matter how bad Christ wants you to be saved, no matter how bad I want you to be saved, without you, repentance, a relationship with Christ, you're lost. 1 Timothy 2.5 Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them, because he was putting into practice the principle that he had been taught, that he had taught on the Sermon on the Mount. It says, you have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Matthew 5, 43, 44. Jesus, the persecuted, was praying for his persecutors. He was living out his sermon on the mount. How many of you live out the sermons of your life? Be it spoken, or be it by words, be it by deeds, the sermon of your life. What is that speaking? If you're doing it with worldly, human wisdom, you're failing. If you're doing it with godly wisdom, you're succeeding. Jesus is saying they don't know what they're doing. And that was true. They didn't. They did not accept that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, the Messiah, their King. They did not accept that. People today reject that. For some reason, I'm running across more and more atheists that tell me there's just no reasonable belief that you can believe in a God. I try not to get into too much of a debate. I try to treat it with love and respect. Once in a while, I need repentance again. Sinners who put Jesus on the cross just weren't aware. Paul summed up about the wisdom of mature Christian hears from the message of the gospel. It says here in Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.18, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us are being saved, it is the power of God. The message of the gospel of Jesus Christ is the saving message that saves each one of us. But it's foolishness to those who are perishing who reject it. The one thief that rejected Christ perished, spending eternity in hell. The other thief who repented, it was the last minute. He wasn't baptized. He hadn't done good works, hadn't done good deeds. He hadn't tithed. He had done nothing except up to that moment curse God. But yet he was saved because he repented, seeing the wisdom of God. He asked to be forgiven. Remember me when you enter into paradise. And Jesus, surely today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus honored that. Jesus would have done that for everyone there. Jesus will do that for everyone here. But you got to come to him in repentance. The wisdom is the message of Jesus Christ crucified. And that wisdom was long before the Heavenly Father sent Jesus here. That wisdom was began before the foundation of the earth. It's a wisdom that we can't even begin to understand. <laughs> Ephesians 1, 3 through 11. A little bit long, but it's worth it. This is the New Living Translation. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has, been ble who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. That is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for his glorious grace that he poured out on us 
who belong to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgiveness of our sins. He has showered his kindness on us along with all the wisdom and understanding. God has now revealed to us his, his mysterious will regarding Christ, which is to fulfill his own good plan. And this is the plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. Furthermore, because we are united in Christ, we've received an inheritance from Christ, so that he, he, for he chose us in advance, and he makes everything work out according to his plan. We are a chosen people. We are a called people. We are a blessed people. We are forgiven people. Now live like that. Live like that. Let me rephrase that. Bob, live like that. I'm a repetitive repenter. I fail Christ. He's never failed me. No ordinary human eyes has seen this revelation. Only way you can see this is through the wisdom of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have to believe in your heart, mind, soul, body, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, is the Savior, came, died, buried, rose again for your sins now in heaven, interceding for us. This moment, this day. Unregenerated ears cannot understand this. There was a time in your life this would not have made any sense. There's been a time in my life when I've questioned many things. I didn't understand God's wisdom. Still don't fully. It's a constant thing. Like Paul said, I've not been complete yet. I'm still seeking for the end. One day, I will have reached it. So will you. But to that time, we keep seeking. The unregenerate mind can't perceive what God has. Only God's true wisdom gets through to our senses, into our soul, and reveals God's relationship to us. 1 Corinthians 2.10 for his spirit searches out everything and shows us God's deep secrets. We're giving the insight through the Holy Spirit. When I told you before I started this, that this was a great message, no matter what I do to it, because it was given to me by the Holy Spirit. God gives us what we need when we need it. Now, to everyone in this uh, sanctuary, everyone hearing this video, watching this video, I don't know what you need today. But evidently, I needed to understand God's wisdom better than I do. So as I got a ringing in my ear now, my voice is going, as I can't articulate very well what's in my heart, I can tell you one thing. Jesus Christ loved you enough that he died for you and loved you even more by forgiving you. If you're saved, there's no way you can ever be thankful enough to God for what he's done. Worldly wisdom, don't let it interfere. Don't let it cause us to stumble. Don't let others be stumbled by it. Jackie and I were talking about success this morning on the way to church. The world looks at success upon people that succeed well. Elon Musk might be an example of success. God looks upon success differently. I think to be successful, you have to be doing what God would have you do, following God's plan. God will give you happiness and contentment. Whatever journey you're on, it needs to be the journey that God has set for you. You can have the lowliest position in the world. You can be one of the poorest people in the world. But if you're doing what God would have you do, you're the most successful person in the world. You could be the richest person in the world, enjoying abundance of things none of us could imagine. But if you don't have that relationship with Christ, you're the poorest person in the world. You're not successful. That's the difference between earthly wisdom and godly wisdom. Most of you know that in your heart. Sometimes we let our minds 
twist us around a little bit. We start thinking about what we don't have rather than what we do have. We think about what we want other than being thankful for having what we need. Ephesians 4.15 goes on to say, Instead, we speak the truth in love, growing in every way more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. God wants to do way more for us than we're allowing God to do. Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might think or ask. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. Many Christians usually apply this, 1 Corinthians 2.9, to the promise of future blessings in heaven, to our future home. But I don't think that's the only context, sex. I think we need to look at 2.9 a little different. The primary meaning of the eyes have not seen what God has planned for us points to the mystery of the gospel. And it's simply not understood by natural man. The human mind cannot comprehend God's spirit. So God has revealed to us the secret. Now, has he told us everything about heaven? No. Do I want to know what I'm going to be doing? Yes. Do I want to know what wonders await me? Uh-huh. Do I wish he would write another supplement to the Bible and tell me all this? Text me, God. Come on. He chooses not to. And I have to use godly wisdom to understand that. If we only look at God from an early, earthly perspective, human eyes, we're blinded to all that. Jesus speaks of one such anticipated marvel. This is in James 1.12. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord had promised to those who love him. Well, wait a second. That's not talking about any of my needs or wants right there, is it? Those who persevere under trial. Judge, remind me. Being at trial is a bad thing, right? Usually. You sure? I wasn't sure. I know any time I've been on trial, it's been a bad thing. And yes, without confessing all my past sins, I've been before a judge more than once. And it's not ever been good. So when God tells me, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, you'll be tried by the world and the world's wisdom. Persevere. 1 Corinthians 13, 12. Now we see things imperfectly, like a puzzling reflection in a mirror, but then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete, then I will know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. So yes, the human mind can understand godly wisdom, but we still are not capable of knowing everything. We still are not capable of understanding everything that God has waiting for us, that God has prepared for us, that God will do for us. We are not capable of doing any of that through our own selves. We have to believe what God has told us, that we have one way to salvation. That's through Jesus Christ. He's the one and only mediator, the one and only salvation, the one and only way. If you understand that, you understand the wisdom of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Oh, let's go to the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you today. I humbly seek forgiveness for my failures. I repent of my sins. I repent of not having the faith that's strong enough, of not having the courage that's strong enough, of not having the knowledge that's deep enough. I ask for knowledge, wisdom, patience, learning, strength, wisdom. I ask, Father, 
that you grant me this. As much as I'm capable of absorbing, Father, I understand I'm a weak vessel. I understand I'm a leaky vessel. Father, you've remade me several times on the potter's wheel. I ask you to continue to mold me, Father. Mold me into what you would have me be. Mold me into who you would have me be. But Father, I ask that for everyone here, hearing the sound of my voice, that they will allow you to mold them into who you would have them be. I ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.